Okay, our next talk is from Dr. Nathan Nelson, who is a professor in the Kansas State University Department of Agronomy, and he teaches courses in soil nutrient management and has an active research program and, uh, focused on nutrient cycling, the fate and transport of nutrients in agroecosystems with the objective of developing best management practices that minimize nutrient loss and maximize nutrient use efficiency. Very well timed that you follow Dr. Compton. Um, and he received his bachelor's degree um, from Kansas State and master's and PhD degrees from, in soil science from North Carolina State University, of which we have many people here in the audience. Um, so uh, let's give a nice welcoming hand to Dr. Nelson. I'm glad to have this opportunity to, to uh, speak with you about how we can align uh, our goals for regenerative agriculture and sustainable phosphorus management, right? Uh, and I'm going to have to start with some definitions. I know they're not the most exciting things to start a presentation with, but gosh, I'll tell you, uh, regenerative agriculture is not an easy thing to, to nail down, and honestly, neither are definitions for sustainable phosphorus management. And so I guess I'll give you, if nothing else, a perspective of kind of where I'm coming from and what this is. So regenerative agriculture is often looked at as really kind of like a philosophy, right, of trying to rebuild the soil, reconnect the agricultural system, and improve diversity and, and things like that. If you Google it online, you find a lot of different infographics that look about the same, but when you get into this, some of the details, some are very similar and some, some are very different. Um, I've tried to put some of the, the ideas that I thought are kind of more, you know, midstream here on this list. We're looking at uh, reducing tillage. That's a big thing, right? Uh, reducing tillage, uh, increasing cover crop use, increasing cropping diversity, even cropping systems, new different types of rotations, more diverse rotations, things like that, all with a goal to build soil biology, uh, a real focus on uh, relying upon soil biology to, su to supply nutrients or increase nutrient availability when it comes to a nutrient side. Uh, along with this, we've got uh, reduce or remove pesticides or synthetic fertilizers. I'll tell you, this is honestly, when you look at the different, different people, uh, that's something that, that uh, that particular point has a pretty wide range of perspectives where some people say their definition is remove altogether any outside nutrient input no outside nutrients. Uh, other people will say, well, no synthetic, and then some people say, well, reduce synthetic, and then some people say, well, let's uh, just precision a application of synthetic. Anyway, so pretty diverse there. Oh, um, often incorporating livestock in the actual system, um, more in the fields, grazing and things like that. Uh, use of livestock manures is included in there somewhere. And then a lot of input on looking beyond the field edge, connecting agriculture to society. I think what's maybe a little bit more universal is the outcomes expected from these systems, right? And so we're looking at improved yield, improved incomes for producers, improved water quality, reduction in soil erosion, reduction in nutrient loss, um, increased biodiversity of the, of the system, uh, more recycling of nutrients within agricultural systems, and these are all good and, and very important things. Uh, often looking beyond the edge of the field and the farm uh, to integrate uh, a regenerative agricultural system is going to reach out and, and uh, support uh, agricultural societies and communities, uh, rebuild those agricultural, uh, the rural economy and the rural society. Uh, and then improved mental and physical health work. So a pretty, pretty broad uh, set of outcomes that are expected from regenerative agriculture. So how would these align with sustainable phosphorus management, right? Or do we need to, do we need to work with some alignment there? Uh, probably the best description of sustainable phosphorus management comes with the 4R uh, approach, the 4R nutrient stewardship. And you know, honestly, if I look at that, uh, a lot of the same things are listed there, right? Uh, the 4R approach was first uh, published back in 2008, 2009. Uh, it's been around for over 30 years. The first mention of right source, right time, right place, and right um, rate was back in like 1988 in a, in a journal article. So these are, these are concepts that have been around and evolving. 
but obviously we're seeing reduced nutrient losses, increased biodiversity, reduced soil erosion, better air and water quality. We're looking at better societal outcomes, uh, increased uh, input. So I guess, I guess what do I have to talk about, right? They're aligned. Uh, there are a lot of challenges, I think, for both of these, I guess, is what it comes down to. Uh, trying to reach this end goal, um, whether you're looking at sustainable phosphorus management or whether you're looking at regenerative agriculture, they kind of emphasize different pieces of the puzzle. Maybe when they're discussing it, uh, their end objectives are the same and their challenges are the same. Um, so I'm going to focus on, uh, I've boiled it down to three kind of general challenges. Uh, soil health trade-offs, then it'd be the same as conservation practice trade-offs. So as we're trying to improve soil health and as we're trying to install conservation practices in fields to attain these goals, we end up with trade-offs. And those are very difficult to manage, so I'll talk about those. Uh, connecting soil health to phosphorus response, we know there's some really amazing things that go on with soil biology and plant-soil relationships that improve nutrient availabilities in soils. It's really difficult to predict how they will work and adjust our fertilizer management on those, so I'll talk about that. And then cycling phosphorus back to the soil, I could talk for an hour on that by itself, and so uh, maybe to, uh, I'll probably just field some questions in the end, I'll talk about it on the side but really, really difficult, big problems trying to look at how we take all of the manure phosphorus, all of the phosphorus and biosolids and get it back to the fields where, where it needs to be put on. A um, lot, of, lot of problems that are, are much larger than an individual producer can, can manage. And so here I'm looking more at what producer decisions, uh, what they can make uh, to, uh, to, sustainable, to, to do the ma uh, sustainable phosphorus management. So, uh, Brief background on no-till. No-till does a great job of improving uh, soil cover, uh, getting more residue on the cover, uh, or on the soil, more residue cover on the soil surface, reducing soil erosion. Uh, it also tends to stratify phosphorus uh, in soils. And so here's, after 20 years of no-till and reduced till, you see that the reduced till soil there, uh, some tillage, but not a lot, uh, still has stratification. This is within the upper, uh, 15 centimeters of the soil, right? So up for six inches. Uh, and we go from the surface in a no-till soil from 175 parts per million down to about five, right? Really, really uh, steep stratification and it pushes a lot of those nutrients up right to the surface where the, um, where the runoff water is interacting with them. Also, in no-till soils, um, because there's not any tillage, if we surface apply our fertilizers, those Fertilizers stay on the soil surface and going to be lost. If we surface apply manures, and this is another one of the challenges with manures, if you surface apply the manure, it stays on the top and exacerbates this stratification. Uh, we can subsurface apply fertilizers pretty easily. Depending upon the manure, uh, it can or can't be done. It really depends upon the manure properties, and, and that's what makes manure difficult to deal with. So if we look at the effects of tillage on sediment uh, or erosion, and phosphorus loss. We see here that uh, no-till, so this is from uh, the Manage database, so a lot of different edge of field water quality studies from around the nation and over lots of time. Uh, and you can kind of summarize this, just kind of a box plot, right? So what's the range of, of erosion that we would expect? You can see a huge decrease in erosion when you go to no-till, right? Um, <clears throat> Dramatic decrease, this is why we love no-till from a soil conservation standpoint, why we promote no-till and I'll always promote no-till, because it does an excellent job of conserving the soil and improving soil biology. It reduces total phosphorus loss, uh, but not quite as much, right? Not quite as much. The big trade-off is with dissolved phosphorus. Now all of a sudden we see an increase in dissolved phosphorus. Dissolved phosphorus is highly reactive, it's highly bioavailable, uh, that could be seen as a negative. Uh, to aquatic ecosystems. It depends upon the aquatic ecosystem, tough to nail down whether this decrease in total phosphorus is outweighed by an increase in, in dissolved phosphorus. But it's not, uh, this is seen in lots of different studies. Here's a meta-analysis uh, done back in 2017. Again, uh, most studies show uh, a decrease in total phosphorus by maybe about 40%, right, uh, in both concentration and load. And, but then we see an increase in dissolved phosphorus by about 30, 40% in both concentration and load. Um, 
A more recent study looking at uh, the effects on, uh, on phosphorus in tile drains. So this was done uh, comparing a few different farms uh, up in the, in the Lake Erie Basin uh, over a four-year period, uh, the no-till with cover crops versus a conventional till. And you can see that the no-till with cover crops sometimes had lower total phosphorus, sometimes had the same or maybe higher total phosphorus, more consistently had higher dissolved reactive phosphorus loads, right? On a larger scale, if we look at Lake Erie, uh, the dissolved, phos uh, dissolved phosphorus concentrations going to Lake Erie steadily declined from the 70s uh, into the mid-90s. This is due to a lot of changes in, uh, in wastewater treatment and ban on phosphates and detergents and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> people were celebrating a uh, lot of gains of what was going on in, in Lake Erie. Uh, and then we converted to no-till. We started reducing tillage. This is a great thing for an erosion standpoint, but we increased, and so again, on a larger scale, a lot of this increase in dissolved reactive phosphorus is attributed to changes in tillage within that basin. So again, trade-offs on, on how, how we manage it. There's not an easy way to, to solve these. I'm gonna talk about some trade-offs now with, uh, with uh, <clears throat> cover crop use. Uh, I'll, re I'll reference uh, a study that I've been involved with or that I lead there at Kansas State University at the, agri uh, the, at the uh, Kansas Agriculture Watershed Field Laboratory where we're looking at the effects of cover crops and phosphorus fertilizer management on, on runoff, on phosphorus losses. Again, soil erosion, even in a no-till system, cover crops do a great job of reducing soil erosion. You see it in the water, you see it in the data every single year. Uh, rock solid 70, 60 to 70 percent. Again, I encourage cover crops. They do a great job of, of saving our soil. Um, but not such a great job at, fo at reducing phosphorus loss. Total phosphorus loads sometimes are no different uh, depending upon the year. Sometimes we increased total phosphorus loss with cover crops. A few times we decreased it. If we look at the total eight-year period, the net change is actually a, a decrease in total phosphorus loss by about 1.7 kilograms per hectare, about a 15% decrease. Now if we look at dissolved reactive phosphorus loss uh, due to cover crop implementation, a pretty solid increase in losses. Uh, pretty much every year except for a few years where we had no difference. Uh, six out of eight years we increased over the eight years an additional 2.3 kilograms per hectare or a 60% increase in dissolved reactive phosphorus loss. So again, a challenge. So how do we manage these challenges as we're trying to implement one practice and then we have a trade-off? <clears throat> phosphorus fertilizer management is an important key to this, both in timing and placement and rate. Uh, for the first part of that study, we looked at differences in timing and placement, uh, a fall broadcast versus a spring injected, and by going to a spring injected application, we reduce our losses 5 to 50 percent, uh, our total phosphorus loss 0 to 30 percent, depending upon the year. Um, so simply changing timing and placement can, can provide a, a pretty big impact on reducing phosphorus loss. Uh, our control still had less phosphorus loss, right? Uh, we could take out phosphorus altogether, and that's been proposed in some of these, sustain in, in some of these uh, regenerative ag systems. So we decided, we said, well, what if we, if we reduce our rate but not take it out completely? And so we changed our system and said, well, we're going to go to a sufficiency approach where we apply just the minimal amount of phosphorus that's needed to maintain our yield. And here we actually saw an interaction with our cover crops where in when the no cover crop system, there wasn't quite as big of a difference uh, between, in, in one year we saw a difference, but in the other years, not as big of a difference when we pulled back on our phosphorus rate. And these aren't really big rates compared to like manure application rates and stuff. Um, but in our cover crop system, more consistently we saw a difference there, right? Where it became more important to try and, and reduce our rate or maintain a sustainable, a very, a very minimal input rate, and that helped quite a bit uh, to reduce our phosphorus, our dissolved reactive phosphorus losses. I'm going to talk a little bit more about connecting soil health to plant nutrition uh, and nutrient uptake. Uh, we know that, uh, that if we uh, 
that plants can release uh, enzymes and that will actually in, increase uh, phosphorus cycling in soils. We'll take some of that organic phosphorus and help it cycle a little bit faster. We know that plants can release organic acids, microorganisms release organic acids. That can increase our phosphorus availability in soils. Um, and we know that increased organic matter can decrease and, key, and, and uh, complex iron and aluminum and change the iron and aluminum chemistry such that that might increase availability of phosphorus. Um, Here's some data from our study where we see uh, a decrease in labile inorganic phosphorus with cover crops, but an increase in labile organic phosphorus, so a shift in the forms of phosphorus in the soils uh, due to cover crop implementation. We see increased enzyme activities, which might cycle this organic phosphorus a little faster, uh, maybe increase availabilities to plants. But we, we really don't see increased crop uptake. This is actually concentration in the grain. Our uptake is actually less in cover crops because we have a little bit of a, a yield loss in a few years um, uh, due to water and, and shading and some other things anyway. Um, but if we're looking at concentrations, one year out of four, we saw an increase in, in the concentration in the grain. Um, and that was actually that year probably due to some yield loss that year that increased concentration. Here's some data that show the effects of, of uh, organic acids in soils on phosphorus availability. Uh, so here we see that increasing the concentration of organic acid, in this case it's oxalic acid or oxalate. Um, as we increase the concentration, we increase the ext extractability of phosphorus. So it makes that phosphorus more available, come into solution easier. Uh, here we see that plants that tend to increase the amount of organic ions in the rhizosphere tend to increase the concentration of phosphorus in the shoots. Uh, so that's great. We've done some work here. This is one of my graduate students, Tom Jid, and he put together some data looking at the effects of uh, at the organic acid release in different crop species and cover crop species. Uh, and the effects of fertilizer application. You can see that if you don't apply fertilizer, those crops respond, right? So crops are responding to the system. This is really interesting to understand how crops will, will respond and try and increase the availability of phosphorus in response to these, uh, these, um, uh, these the, the feedback from the soil. And we see there are differences between cover crops and and some of our main crops, where some of these cover crop species have a better, uh, will release higher rates of organic acids. However, with all of this, it has become very difficult to link some of these changes in soil health to changes in water quality or crop response. Um, I don't have a lot of figures to show here because people tend to not show figures of no effect. <laughs> so. I've got, I've got the titles and I've got some statements out of, their, out of their abstract saying, yeah, we didn't really find what we wanted. And so why is it that we don't see this connection where, uh, where, we, where we see on one hand that crops and, and microorganisms and increasing biology can increase the availability of phosphorus, but yet it's not coming back in decreasing phosphorus uh, response and it's not uh, maybe causing lower water or lower phosphorus losses. Um, some data on soil test from our study here over, over a nine-year period. We built up the soil and then we started to draw it down and we see uh, that we're mining out the phosphorus. We're in very, very, very low soil phosphorus for our control. And then here this last year, did in this low soil phosphorus, um, in these low soil phosphorus soils, did a cover crop increase phosphorus availability and phosphorus uptake. We saw no increase in, in corn yield, right? Uh, we didn't see an increase in phosphorus concentration. We didn't see an increase in phosphorus uptake. There was no indication that those cover crops in, a, in an extremely phosphorus deficient system were going to increase that phosphorus availability. So really tough. Uh, we did see that the cover crops didn't grow as much when we didn't apply phosphorus. So we had a decrease in cover crop biomass and because of a decrease in cover crop biomass, we did see a, an increase in erosion in the cover crop system that didn't have phosphorus applied compared to the cover crop systems where we did apply phosphorus. So again, yet another trade-off, if we're not balancing and managing our, our soil phosphorus, 
we're not going to be as effective with our, with our conservation systems. So this brings the idea that maybe we go to uh, different sources of phosphorus, right? And people have said, well, maybe use low-soluble phosphorus. We have data that would say low-soluble phosphorus would have less runoff. Uh, very limited number of studies that have looked at this. Most all of them, uh, or actually all of them, two or three, uh, have looked at surface application. Well, we already know that surface application is bad with a highly soluble phosphorus fertilizer. We already know we can subsurface apply that fertilizer, and we should. So I, the question is, do we gain a whole lot compared to our best management practices with conventional fertilizers? We're not really for sure. We're not for sure how this is going to impact crop yield. So we need, we need to investigate this more to see what, what trade-offs there might be there. As kind of a final slide, in, our, in general soil fertility, we're looking for big trends. And uh, we kind of look at the, at the cluster of data in these systems. This is looking at relative yield versus soil test phosphorus. And we see, yeah, there's a, we'd say that's a good, a good trend, right? The bulk of the data show that at low soil fo test phosphorus, we have a response. At high soil test phosphorus, we don't. That's what most of our recommendations are based on that general trend, the, 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 the center of the data. Maybe what we need to be looking at for regenerative agricultural systems and for more sustainable phosphorus systems is those outliers, right? Why is it, why is this group of soils, why are they not responding where we would expect that they really should? Why are these soils out here responding when we would expect that they wouldn't? And can we do a better job of making recommendations in those, in those outlying situations? Right. That's a pretty big challenge also for soil fertility, to understand these systems. So um, in conclusion, um, I feel that the outcomes from sustainable uh, phosphorus management and regenerative agriculture align pretty well. Uh, they both face the same set of challenges at trying to attain those outcomes with phosphorus management. Um, We'd like to see conservation practices in place, no-till, cover crops, they're great. We just need to do a better job of managing our source, our rate, our timing, and placement of fertilizers, phosphorus fertilizer in those systems. Um, we need some more research on soil biology and its impacts on phosphorus and crop response. We need more research on low-soluble fertilizers, and we need a lot of research and, uh, on how to uh, balance uh, bring more of that, of that uh, manure phosphorus back into our soils where we're, where we're using uh, uh, fertilizer. Anyway, any questions? I guess I want to thank the funders for the research that I presented here. Uh, I guess I uh, appreciate all of them, the 4R Research Fund, FAR, NRCS, Department of Agriculture, uh, and Soybean Commission. So thank you. Any questions? So we have time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I had a curiosity um, if uh, biostimulants are considered in uh, regenerative agriculture because they may increase phosphorus acquisition from the low solubility forms that you just showed. Sure, yeah. So biostimulants, uh, and there's a, a wide range of those. Uh, some of them would be trying to increase organic acid release or something from plant roots. Sometimes they would be microorganisms that would release some of those organic acids to increase the availability. And so uh, whether that's coming from a natural system, like from those cover crops or some biostimulant, uh, we, we face the same challenge there, is it's really tough to identify how they're impacting the crop response. And in, in many cases, we see that there might not be any impact from some, of those, from some of those changes in biology that we would expect would impact crop uptake. In other cases, we see a response, but it's, it's not maybe a full replacement for fertilizer. So it's still challenges there for understanding how we can use those uh, and, and take advantage of them. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. I have a new project on soil health in Kansas, so I'm going to be talking to you after. But um, I'm curious how you talk to farmers about a lot of these data, like what kinds of recommendations and how do you share information back with like the farmers, maybe if you're working on production farmland. Sure. Yeah, so uh, as far as the first thing I say to farmers is there's no silver bullet. 
very much overutilized, but fits here. A lot of producers will sometimes uh, think that, hey, I'm doing cover crops or I'm doing no-till so I don't have to worry about other things in my system. You say, no, we have to look at the whole system. We need to build conservation systems, and that, and that includes still paying attention to your rate and your timing, your placement, your phosphorus fertilizer. I'm interested to know that uh, how soil microbial activity can have an effect on the cover crop applications, like in a limiting environment, phosphorus limiting environment, how the results might change uh, in those applications. Okay, I, um, let me restate that to make sure I understand. You want to understand, your, your question is how, how would increased microbial activity affect phosphorus availability? Uh, yes. Okay, in, in general. Uh, increased microbial activity uh, could affect phosphorus availability through a few different mechanisms. The main ones that people focus on are, are releases of enzymes. So microorganisms will, in, will, will release phosphatase enzymes, and those enzymes will help um, mineralize organic phosphorus forms, and so you'd have a, a faster turnover of organic phosphorus. And then the other thing is they, they can release uh, different organic acids, low-weight molecular organic acids, which can... Um, uh, through a ligand exchange mechanism, exchange phosphorus off of adsorption sites. And so that helps move some of the adsorbed phosphorus from the soil surfaces into solution where the plants can then take it up. Uh, they'll also drop pH. Uh, uh, those organic acids can drop pH, can change some of the chemistry there, and increase availability of, of phosphorus. So those are the mechanisms. It, it's hard to see, it, it's hard to identify those in some in crop response. It's easier to see in, in lab studies. Okay, are there any other questions before we break for coffee? Yes? More? No? Okay, there's yeah. one over there. Uh, this is a really simple one. I think you showed that plot of different crops and their production of organic acids. Does that does that mean that generally the ones that are producing more organic acids you think will work better with the uh, the insoluble fertilizers? Yeah, so great question. Would those that release more organic acids maybe increase the availability of phosphorus from, from uh, low-soluble phosphorus fertilizers? Um, that's a great question. Um, we haven't addressed that sp specific question. In that same study, we just looked at the availability of phosphorus from the soil and the availability of future phosphorus additions. We looked at the effects of those organic acids on phosphorus adsorption in the soils and the effects on the availability of the soils in there. And it was, well, I didn't show that data. You might guess why, because we didn't find anything. <laughs> it, we saw differences in organic acid release, but we did not see a correlation between the amounts of organic acid and the uh, phosphorus availability or phosphorus adsorption in the soils. Uh, thank you. Just uh, another one here. By the way, uh, Matt just informed me that we're having a technical glitch with the uh, online yeah. system. So if we're not reading your questions, it's because we have a computer problem. But we're getting lots of them from the audience. Um, so yeah, I have a really quick question. Do you, if you look at uh, um, the relative increase, whether it's no-till or like a cover crop, mm -hmm. for the uh, dissolved P and. Uh, um, but if you look at it from uh, like uh, the overall mass balance point of view, mm -hmm. the total amount of P applied, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so is that a soluble version, uh, the soluble part, is that uh, sufficient enough to make a difference? Yeah, so, so how important is this trade-off where we're reducing total phosphorus into the, into the system, but yet we're increasing, uh, we're, we're changing the form? It's soluble rather than, than sediment, right? Um, that is a great question, and it's a question I've asked a lot of aquatic biologists, and maybe there are other people here in the room. Uh, I don't know, Jane, what your background is with EPA. I've asked a lot of people at EPA, what does it matter if it's total or, or if it's dissolved? And I get different responses. Um, it's definite that the dissolved reactive phosphorus is more bioavailable, right? Uh, it's it could potentially result in like, uh, you know, more sudden algal blooms or something like this because you get this flush of soluble phosphorus into a water body. Um, but there's not, I have not seen any good data to say that it really does that. And I think right now most, uh, like EPA, most water 
quality things, they're, they're focused on total phosphorus. And so they would say, well, reduction in total phosphorus is good. I, I'm not sure. What do you think? Somebody, grab, a, grab a microphone, you can answer that question. I, I would say, yeah, we always want to reduce total phosphorus loading, sure, because eventually it's going to turn over. Yeah, we definitely would like to reduce total phosphorus loading, because that's the most but reliable does it, correlation. Does it, does it with, matter if we're increasing the, 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 if we're changing the form? It, as you said, the, the immediate impacts will be more obvious when you increase DRP um, in the system, but total phosphorus has its own, you know, once it gets into the lake, we'll have its own turnover time and eventually enter circulation. So, yeah, if we can, yeah, all hands on deck for all forms of phosphorus. But as you point out, there's trade-offs. It's really, really important. 